morning, Saints. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be back at St. Albans and to see how things have grown. Um, I say that in lots of ways, thinking about the numbers of folks, the faces I don't recognize in the pews, thinking about the tomatoes which are looking really fine out in the garden, lamenting the number of crosses that continue to take up residence there as we mourn those who've lost their lives to gun violence. So we pray that God will continue to increase in you and in us the growth that is good and life-giving, that we might do all that we can to diminish those things like hate and violence that we would like to see die away. I want to begin by saying that I'm coming here to make my pastoral visit in a day in which we're supposed to be celebrating the life of this parish. You know, we've got all of the good ministry that you have done since my last visit to celebrate and talk about. We um, have all kinds of things that we might want to make for joy in our time together. When I visit, as you know, we are as complete as we can be as a church. I bring all of the 47 congregations here with me, and the Diocese of Indianapolis is in its fullness in this place right here, right now. It's not the day, however, that I want to have the readings about slaves and giving up all your possessions. So, um, but here we are, and Mother Debbie, you're welcome. I'd like to show you on all of that. It'll come around again in a few years. So these are heavy topics, right? These are not the sort of like, woohoo, let's stand up and cheer kinds of readings that we've been given. But as it turns out, I think they are perfect perfect for what it means to reflect on our commitment to Christ, which is something that we renew and do every time the bishop makes a visitation. They are just right. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you have seen the materials that have come out from the New York Times with the 1619 Project. Has anyone seen that? Let me commend it to you. You can Google it and find it all online. You can actually order the hard copies from the New York Times website. But that 1619 project, which is helping us to confront in a real way some of the work that's been done over the years historically to understand the legacy of slavery in this country is important material. We mark right now the 400th anniversary of at least by most accounts, of the first enslaved peoples coming to this country. And so it's a significant moment in our time to be looking at that history and to be doing what is really deep, difficult, and ultimately necessary work. On the other hand of things, I'm also in the process of packing up my house because I'm moving. And so um, just a few miles away, so not too far, staying in the city of Indianapolis, but I don't know about you, but if you've ever moved before, it typically you know, involves a lot of looking at your stuff and perhaps doing some purging. Now, um, there are a whole bunch of people, maybe you're in this congregation today, who love Marie Kondo and that sort of, does it spark joy, you keep it, and if it doesn't spark joy, you throw it away. People talk about Marie Kondoing their, their house and getting rid of their possessions. That's not me. <laughs> Some of you know and have been asking about, which I'm very grateful, you know, the hurricane Dorian that has come through the Bahamas, where um, all of my husband's family lives, um, we are wrestling with the fact that even as we are grateful for our many possessions here, that all of our relatives there have lost everything they own. No home, no clothes, no place to be. And, um, and we're figuring out how best to care for that whole country and those we know who need um, just the basics. And so I was what, with what it means to have any stuff when so many have so little or nothing. It's tempting, therefore, to take today's lessons, particularly from the Gospel of Luke, and turn it into a message about holy renunciation and non-attachment. But that would actually miss the larger point which is this. Being a Christian costs something. And we know this, we talk about this all the time. Grace is free, 
God's love is freely given, full stop, very simple, straightforward. But following Christ as our pathway to God actually does cost us something. Not as a payback for God's free grace, Christianity is not a quid pro quo faith. We don't sort of give up one thing in order to get something from God. It doesn't work that way. But it costs something because of the fact that we are human, we are not God, and so we cannot have it all, we cannot do it all, we have to make choices. There is no sort of big Labor Day sale that's coming to make the cost of being a Christian any easier to bear. So what are we talking about with Luke's Gospel? From Luke's Gospel, we come to understand that Jesus has three demands. If you just go through it as it's given in the reading, there are three demands. These. One, we must hate our fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, and even our own lives. Two, whoever doesn't carry the cross and follow Jesus cannot be his disciple. Three, none of you can become his disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Get all that? So the first thing we have to acknowledge, I think, is that Jesus was prone to hyperbole, right? Like, the, you know, let's just, he said a lot of outrageous things to make a bigger point. He's really trying to make this point to the audience. And so I just want to bring a little nuance to that and maybe clear a few things up. Jesus doesn't want you to hate your parents, right? Jesus doesn't want you to hate your siblings. Jesus doesn't even want you to hate your stuff your possessions. But what this is about is quite simple and very difficult. Jesus just wants you to love God more. To love God more than all of us. To love the one you cannot possess more. To love God above all else. To love God above even your own life. To love God knowing that you cannot possess God, control God. And if you are to possess anything, if you are to treasure any possession above all else, if you're about to hold on to that one thing, it is to protect and love and treasure your identity as a beloved child of God, created with the spark of the divine inside of you. And if you're to possess the second most important thing and treasure this next to the most important thing, you are to acknowledge that that spark of the divine also lives in other people. Simple. End of sermon. Easy, right? I could sit down now and you're like, got it, we're good. Right? But if it were that easy, we wouldn't be having the problems of the world we're having. So to kind of help give some shape to this, I want to actually take us back to that letter to Philemon that we heard, the epistle. Now you know that this is the entire letter, read in its, complete, in its completeness that you just heard. And I would say that if you've got that lesson to take it home with you, to, you know, I think it bears reading over a number of times because it's quite stunning, actually, what's happening in 21 short verses. It's a short piece, it's complicated, and it shows up all the challenges that come with being a Christ follower in the world. When you dedicate yourself to actually living as if God is above all else, then things get challenging and hard because it requires a dedication, a focus, which is hard to sustain if we actually attain it at all. So here's what's going on. Philemon is in an interesting position. He's the owner of a slave, Onesimus, who has been baptized, basically making him his brother, his equal in Christ. So all that business about there being no Jew or Greek, slave or free, we're all one in Christ, is right there. And Paul is writing to Philemon and asking him to free Onesimus and return him to Paul as a free man. Paul has done great things for Philemon, which he goes on and on and on about. Ah, you owe me your very life. Right? I mean, Paul is laying it on thick. Laying it on thick. Because apparently Paul has brought Philemon to Christ and has changed. 
changed his life forever. And so, you know, he's wanting something big here. But Paul, who is a man of his time and culture, you know, it would not have occurred to Paul to just say, you know, while we're at it, let's just destroy the whole whole institution of slavery. He's not actually trying to take down the institution of slavery, but he knows that a slave who is made a Christian is now standing on a different plane than he was before. And that at least in this case, Paul is trying to live, trying to live out what being a Christ follower means at its most central, which is this person is just like me, the lover of God, whether he's a slave or not. And so he wants Philemon to let Onesimus go, let him free, to set free one of his most precious possessions. And so Philemon has some choices to make. He can take the easy way, which is to separate what he does at work, or in the neighborhood, or in his home, from what he does at church. We never do that, right? <laughs> It's easy to do. When he's surrounded by his church community, he has lots of support for being a Christian. But outside of church, where the culture really doesn't care so much if he's following Jesus, he can act differently. So the easy way has his advantages. Finally, he can convince himself that he is in fact a devout follower of Jesus without having to change anything about the way he acts outside of the religious community. And so, for example, during church gatherings, probably held at his own home, Philemon can treat Onesimus as a brother. We're all the same right in this church house. But after church, after church, Philemon can punish Onesimus if he drops a bowl of soup on the floor. And both would be perfectly normal, expected, acceptable, and culturally supported. Those outside of the church looking in, for those people, freeing Onesimus and returning him to Paul looks like craziness. How could you even imagine treating this slave like a regular person? But to the Christian community, it's the natural thing to do. So I'd ask you, as you think about that lesson, what would you do? With the friends outside of the church looking on and the cultural kind of pressures we live with, it's not an easy question to answer. And what does Philemon do in the end? We never find out. But we can imagine how we would want, how we would want this episode to end with Onesimus going free. And as we consider how to heal the sins of racism and slavery, we ought to keep this particular letter from Paul in mind. Because our faith actually does call us to rise above our secular culture and do the work of truth-telling and repair and reparations and reconciliation that is necessary for the true healing and setting free of everybody. All of us are bound up until we do that work. If we think about what Luke is talking about here, He's actually calling us to rise above all of the stuff that would kind of keep us held down. The things that would bind us from living our true faith as Jesus followers. He says basically, if you can't take up the cross, stay on the sidelines because this is hard work. It means making difficult choices whether you're in the church or outside in the world. It costs something. Christianity is not a spectator sport. You can't just look out at other people and go, look at how they are in this space, and let's just watch. We have to do hard internal spiritual work all of the time. And even though there's a part of us which desire this community because it makes us feel good, we know that we need each other when the times get hard, and it gets really hard to stay on the path. So following Jesus means, yes, putting Christ in the center of all of our lives, our church life, our work life, school, social groups, the playground, the supermarket. We have to, we have to, I have to figure out over and over again, minute by minute, how to put Jesus first. 
and to remember that beloved spark of the divine that is always led inside me and everybody else I encounter. It sounds simple, but it can be so hard, and God knows it, which is why we need each other. We can't be Christian alone because it's so hard. It's not how it's designed to go. Alan Culpepper says that the language of cross-bearing has been corrupted by overuse. He says, bearing the cross has nothing to do with chronic illness or painful physical conditions or trying and difficult family relationships. He says, it is instead what we do voluntarily as a consequence of our commitment to Jesus Christ. So if this was a sales speech for like new Christians that I wanted to make in the community, it would be a hard sell, <laughs> right? But that's okay, because it's worth it. You wouldn't be here, I imagine, if it wasn't worth it. The next time I come, I so Mother Debbie, I would love to be able to be confirming, reaffirming commitments of faith with all of you. I hope you'll pray about that. The renewing of this commitment is something that we're called to do because we have to mark the occasions of saying yes once again. I want to renew this thing that is so hard and so life giving and so worth it. And I want to do that work and share that and make it public in this community. I pray that our lives will continue to be shaped by Jesus and that cross, which is a cruciform faith and life, where we are constantly learning how to live and die and rise with Jesus. It changes us. And because it changes us, we change with God the world. And this life in Christ can be as joyful and wonderful and life-giving and soul-saving and heart-expanding as it can ever be. But just remember, it's going to cost you. Amen.